The 2016 election has been eye-opening for me personally and for a lot, there's been a lot of personal reflection around what does it mean to be involved for a lot of people. I think, and I hope that we take President Trump's victory as a warning um, of what disengagement can cost us. And I think our leaders have failed to lead on a lot of different dimensions. Um, I think government has lost a productive culture of public service that makes it hard to participate. It makes it hard to understand the value of engaging in politics. Our first associations with the word politician is like corruption, dishonesty, right? When public service should be about our highest ideals. It should be about our collective success. It should be about what is best and most ambitious for a group of people working together to around a shared sense of purpose. And so I think as people wake up to, wait a second, how is this possible here? I think there is both, there's a couple of things at work there. One is a, you know, as the country becomes more urban and urban centers are decidedly more liberal, we have a sense that the country is more, much more liberal than it actually is. It turns out it's a really big country. It turns out there are a lot of people that still don't live in cities. It turns out there are a lot of sort of frustrated people who live in cities who believed in Obama because of the promises he made about changing the system that Trump was a much more natural successor to than, President, than Secretary Clinton was. And so I think the concept of someone who is frustrated and anxious seeing President Obama fail to largely change the culture of politics, see Trump as the bolt for the China shop, right? And there's a pretty straight line, and this is a lot easier to see in retrospect. I thought Secretary Clinton was gonna win. So this is all with the benefit of hindsight and a lot of thought and a lot of talking to a lot of people in a lot of places that aren't Chicago and aren't downtown New York. Um, but what I think this has awakened in people is the reality that people have to participate. That, you know, there's this saying, you know, that history is decided by the people that show up. There's like nine different versions of that aphorism that are largely true in a participatory democracy, right? And I think we've gotten a little lazy and I think President Trump scares a lot of people um, in a way that has been amazing to watch new people engage in politics. And I think the question, to, to get back to where the question started, which is, okay, where do people begin? This is where the increased access that technology provides to low barriers to participation are really, really great. So you can start participating in politics just by being more aware, being more educated, being more plugged into what is actually happening in, with leaders, with leadership, with campaigns, uh, at a level of just access to that process is so much greater than it's ever been, right? But there's a choice and a desire on our side that we have to go and seek out those questions, answers to those questions. Um, and then there are so many ways to start to engage in simple ways. Calling congressmen, writing letters, like everything from, you know, five calls to resist bot to, you know, and these are all progressive oriented things, but all of the same tactics apply for conservatives, right? And a lot of what we see with, you know, progressives really embracing the power of being face to face with elected officials in town halls was something that the, the Tea Party used to incredible effect in the uh, you know ten years ago, ten years ago in two thousand ten midterms in particular, right? Just post the Obama election, um, and so these these tools themselves are not particularly partisan. Um, but they've reduced the barrier to participation sufficiently that it makes it easier for sort of first-time activists to get started. And what I would say is that there's one, there's a couple of sort of like lies at the heart of progressive politics that are super problematic. One of them is that all politics is local. All poli I would say that when Tip O'Neill said that in the 80s, local was meant to be a, an analog for what matters most to you. The, the true statement is all politics is personal. What matters to you is what matters to you. And that might be local or it might not be. And the thing that I always say to people is to start, right? That don't wait for, there is no magic way to participate. We live in a republic. We have to win elections to gain power. We don't live in a direct democracy. So like, you know, 
large scale open source policy making is really is interesting for as a listening exercise and for understanding communities and for surfacing ideas that we haven't thought of. But it's not we don't live in a direct democracy where open source policy actually creates policy directly. So we have to participate in all kinds of ways. I think one of the places where we need more attention is converting this kind of this sort of generic resistance participation we see on the left right now into political power, right? So uh, the, in LA, in the city elections back in March, fewer people voted than turned out for the Women's March on Inauguration Day. That's maybe just a function of the fact that it wasn't a contested mayoral election and it's sort of off cycle and not competitive, but an 11.5% voter participation rate, turnout rate, should scare all of us. That's, that's a problem, right? Because, because we do live in a republic. We do need to believe in the value of participating in this process. And this is where leadership matters a lot. This is where reclaiming the sort of joy and optimism and public service about politics and government is something that has to be a coherent priority of the party, of our leaders, of people running for office on both sides, or we're gonna be in a place where democracy is a system of faith and cynicism is extremely dangerous and long-term corrosive. There's been a lot of talk about the normalization of you know, propaganda and lying and uh, since President Trump took office, and I think those things are super problematic because the institutions of the system matter a lot matter a lot more than the than the personalities um, and when personalities start trumping institutions no pun intended or pun intended I guess uh, you start leaning toward autocracy pretty fast and that's nowhere we want to go the net neutrality argument usually gets wrapped around things like you know Netflix and cable television and sort of con sort of commercial content distribution that kind of thing I think the place where net neutrality is particularly important is around activism, right? And around governments, it, it, you know, if companies can change the way, you know, they uh, route packets and prioritize content based on financial decisions, they can also do it based on ideological decisions. And you start inching your way toward, you know, government-run media, it, it's not a long jump between that question and government managed suppression of participation in from insurgent or counter opinion ideas, right? That's not a long leap. And I think that I worry less about the commercial problems because I think, look, if Verizon, if Netflix has to pay more for faster pipes, they're figured out. Like, they'll figure out how to make money. They'll figure out how to get people more episodes of House of Cards. It will work out for them. They will make money. Activists not being able to use services like Twilio effectively to call Congress because internet neutrality has changed the, you know, the way that people have access to information is, is potentially uh, catastrophic for people understanding that their participation is valuable. And one of the things that these tools, like I said, I said when we're thinking about this question of new activism and giving more access to more participation, if people don't believe that that participation will work or it literally won't work, now we're starting to create barriers to participation. And in a participatory democracy, no barriers to participation are good. Whether they're voting, whether it's content, whether it's listening, whether it's being able to hold leaders to account, none, limits on any of those things are bad.